Welcome to Book Tour, two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book we're going to be talking about tonight. You know what? Before we get into that, I just want to acknowledge right up front, um, we have some like changes to how you can listen to us. And I want to see if it's something that is important to people. So I'm going to take a minute and just acknowledge the fact that, uh, see, I didn't even know. I, I knew this was a thing when we got an email saying, hey, join this. But um, apparently Amazon Music is joining the ever-growing list of places you can listen to podcasts. And we're on that now. I will be honest. I've known Amazon Music was a thing. And quite honestly, it probably has kind of by default the largest like paid subscription base because you get it as part of Prime. Yeah. And I don't think I've once even even clicked on it. Here's the deal. Uh, so, yeah, they, they reached out, I'm assuming, to I don't know how they re- we got an email about it, like notifying us that it was a possibility. So I don't even now I'm wondering how the hell did that happen? Like they cold called us, right? Yeah, it's, it's not something interesting. That, yeah, it's not something that we went out of our way. Like I got, I know we got an email, and I I clicked the thing and filled out the information. But now I'm wondering how the hell did they know to to reach us? Yeah, anyway, regardless, dude, there's some <laughs> like weird like podcast directory somewhere that we're not aware of. Yeah, and it's just got like our names and emails and stuff on it. Yeah. Good um. So hopefully, uh, especially since there's uh, so many people who have Amazon Music, like you just said, hopefully this makes it easier for some people to get access to our podcast. Uh, We had someone reach out to us uh, one time asking if we were on Google Music. And it was weird because Google Music had podcasts on it, but Google also had Google Podcasts. And we were on Google Podcasts, but not Google Music with podcasts. And so then I told them, hey, you can find us here. And they said, we didn't even know that was a thing. So um, I I guess the point of this is now you can find us on Amazon Music. You can find us on Google Music, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. We have a YouTube channel. And those are just like the main six ways to get a hold of us. But like if you have like a a one-off kind of podcast app that you use, you should be able to find us there too. Everywhere. We're fucking everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, you open uh, up your fridge, you push, you know, push that head of lettuce to the side. We're yeah. back there. <laughs> it's so funny because, <laughs> um, so Spotify, you know, recently got into the podcast game by recently. I mean, I think they started probably like a year ago and, and I don't know if Amazon like kind of just launched this or, or maybe it's been going on for a year and nobody like we didn't know, but then they emailed. So we knew. You know what I mean? But it's like, yeah, I feel like podcasts are kind of finally mainstream now that Amazon's latched out onto them. Uh, <laughs> dude. And that's, I can't tell you how often I think about like, well, this didn't fucking exist when we started our podcast. And like the people who are starting a podcast right now have it so easy in comparison to uh, when we were just getting started and everything, like nothing made any sense. So that's my little like back in my day rant but um yes i just wanted to acknowledge so also on our website we did add an updated uh where to listen page where you can click on that and um the thing i like about it is let's say you're on your phone go to our website you click on the where where to listen page all of the links that we put on there will take you to either the app store or take you to the app if you already have it uh, installed on your mobile devices um, and we tried that with iOS and Android works both ways. So, um, it should be super easy to find us on the major services, regardless of whether you're on your computer or if you're on a mobile device. Or if you've had someone put this on a cassette for you and then you're playing it in your car. <laughs> oh man, I'm going to forget, but I have, I, I, I heard a funny thing about cassettes recently. So, oh, do, do tell. No, let's go. Let's go for it. So Netflix came out with um, a sequel to their. Um, they had a movie called The Babysitter that came out like a couple years ago. You watched the goddamn sequel, didn't you? I did. I hated the first one. So, but people were <laughs> liking the second one. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll watch it. And I did. And um, there was a scene where um, these two, two of the kids, you know, they're what? They're still in high school or whatever. That's how old they are. And one of them said something about like how cassettes are special because like they're so fragile and you never know when the last time you'll be able to listen to it is. And I was like, get out of here with this bullshit, kid. 
Like, <laughs> I'm uh, sure that I had cassettes that were like in a fire and then got pulled out and would still play. Yeah, except if like the tape got loose, and then yeah, that's the know, yeah, yeah, and then you'd like use a pencil, right, to rewind it or a pen or whatever. But then it never played right; it'd just be garbled over wherever it crunched up. But he made it sound like it was fucking parchment inside these things, and it's like, yeah. uh, it's not yeah. quite right, but like it's cute how they romant- romanticized it. That's how we'll be talking about VHS tapes one day. Oh, yeah. Um, wow. I guess we should probably talk about the book that we're that we're here to talk about. Um, so, here's a bio of the author Paul Michael Anderson. He's the writer of the collection "Bones Are Made to Be Broken," which Fangoria magazine called endlessly stunning supremely disquieting and author Jack Ketchum called a dark carnival of rigorous intelligence and compassion as well as that's a weird thing because now it says the other book as well as the novella how we broke with Bracken McLeod standalone his next book will be arriving summer of 2020 from perpetual motion machine publishing he lives in northern Virginia with his wife and daughter and obviously standalone is what we're talking about now it did arrive in the fall of 2020 Here is the book synopsis for standalone. They are killers. They are monsters. They are evil. They stalk through summer camps, abandoned hospitals, run down schools and isolated houses, hunting anyone foolish enough to visit these places, leaving behind carnage, terror, death and destruction. Sometimes there are survivors. Always there is blood. And they do it to protect and preserve all of existence across the multiverse. But now they are the ones being stalked and hunted. And life as we know it hangs in the balance unless they figure out a way to survive. Here's what I want to say about the synopsis. If you want to talk about catching someone off guard, that third paragraph where it switches to and they do it to protect and preserve all of existence across the multiverse, that's that's a little bit of a of a caffeine shot. Like when you're reading that, you're like, okay, all right, they're obviously they're they're slasher serial killers. But that little twist there. Um, definitely yeah. a way to catch someone's attention. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, now, I want to—I I vaguely mentioned, um, I think, on the last episode when we were talking about what book we were listening to next, listening to next, reading next. My mind's all over the place tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, Sorry, I think you—I think you might have <laughs> lightly spoiled an upcoming episode. Yeah, damn but it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned that uh, this came onto my radar because of a Stephen King tweet that Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing responded to. I found the original tweet. He says, the best novel idea I never wrote and probably never will is I, Jason, the first person narrative Jason Voorhees, and his hellish fate killed over and over again at Camp Crystal Lake. What a hellish existential fate. And then, uh, yeah, so then. They were like, hey, if you th- if you like that idea, check out this book. And I was like, all right, well, maybe we'll check out this book. And we did. We're here to talk to you about it. I want to acknowledge up front, it's not a long book. So this is probably going to be one of those shorter discussions. Um, I think it's mm-hmm. the actual like main story. The book is like 200 pages, but the main story clocks in just around 160 because there's like a separate additional short story that is added on after. So we're looking at like a 160 page book. Probably not going to get too deep into discussion with this. Correct. But we will start, as we always do, right at the beginning. So uh, we the book opens on a very, very, very familiar scene for anybody who's familiar with horror movies. It is a uh, lakeside, um, some teenagers there kind of doing their thing. And we're viewing all of this through the eyes. And, and again, Rob, you could correct me if i go too far into into spoiling the story but through the eyes of a guy standing there in essentially a spacesuit yeah uh <laughs> it's funny because this, it's written in classic like horror especially slasher kind of perspective stuff but then yeah the spacesuit kind of throws you off um but he's got that he's got that killer momentum where like he shows up the kids don't know he's there he's obviously got a weapon i think it's a hammer no, is it a knife? It's a hammer. Hatchet, maybe? Hammer. Hatchet. No, you're right. It's hatchet, a hatchet. Yep. And so, yeah, the scene starts off with uh, your typical bat, like scary movie killer rampage of killing. There's a couple kids by the, you know, the fire outside, and he kills them one at a time. And then he just moves on to find the next group of kids, and he dispatches with them. And then 
and then on and on. So it, it, it plays out like the classic, like big killer rampage scene in a, a scary movie um, with the exception of like, it's not drawn out over hours and hours or whatever. It's taking place all at once uh, for the sake of this scene. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's weird differences. Like uh, it's from the perspective of the killer. And so we're, we're seeing what the killer's thinking and every now and then, it sounds very much like, you know, it seems very much like he's being told, he was given orders how to, you know, what to do and when. And it's much more of like a job than like a, he's a crazy killer, like out for revenge or something. So it's, it's early on, you find out this plot isn't just like crazy killers. There's something, there's something different motivating uh, what's happening. Yes, there is. There's like a bury the hatchet joke in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't remember that. No, I'm saying from I was going to say, and that's, you know, he buries the hatchet, which is the saying for like making peace with. Did you know, do you know the etymology? Is that the right word? The etymology of bury the, bury the hatchet? No, no, I know. No. So it's yeah. So it's so it sounds like a crazy thing. Like, right. Like I go, oh, all right. So you and I made up, we buried the hatchet, which sounds like the fuck does that have to do with anything? Right. Uh, I believe, or it is believed, I believe what is believed, that um, uh, Native Americans, um, when they would like make peace with like another tribe, they would each literally bury a hatchet. So when you think bury the hatchet, you're probably thinking like someone shows just like like swings a hatchet down into a tree stump or, or whatever. They would actually bury it in the ground. So symbolically like laying to rest aggression or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, it yeah. makes sense. It tracks. <laughs> So, um, but at any rate, so our spaceman, for lack of a better term, although he's definitely not a spaceman, as Rob was explaining, is named Jenkins. And we find out that a couple, couple, three years ago, Jenkins um, was approached by a, I don't know, you know, he kind of describes it as almost like a ghost or a spirit, but some by some spectral form um, that explains to him that uh, he has two choices. He can continue on with life the way he knows it, <clears throat> and certainly the universe he lives in will eventually collapse and him and all of his loved ones will be gone. Or he can take a job with them and do something about it. So guess what that job is? <clears throat> it is portraying a real life um, Jason, you know, Freddy, Wolfman, whatever, um, and, and and killing off people the way we think about it happening in the movies. Yeah. So imagine that that's that's so that that's a it's a unique approach on um, the motivating these killers is like basically like, hey, to save your world, to save your universe, you have to become <laughs> like a, a serial killer. Um, and so, yeah, what would you do in that? Uh, uh, let's do it. What would you do in that case, Livia? So this outrageous, ridiculous situation, you're given those options. Which way do you go? It's so it's so hard to think about this because I, I think I would have thought I lost my mind and I would probably just ignore the, the beckoning yeah. call because I think like, no, I've lost my fucking mind. So I, I imagine if there was some way that I, I wouldn't think that, that it could be, you know, like a you know, that, that they could somehow prove that I'm not crazy and that this is a legit thing, I, I, I'd probably do it. Yeah, I think that's the tricky part is um, we didn't get a lot of explanation of the the pitch part, you know, for for when, when he got uh, recruited. Yep. So depending on how that pitch went and, and how convincing it was, like, I think that, that has a lot to do with. Because, like, on its face, I'd just be like, well, you're fucking crazy. And I would just, you know, bl- you know, Maybe go see someone and be like, "Hey, I'm hallucinating, really weird ghosts." But otherwise, yep. yeah, wouldn't be wouldn't be too excited about. I mean, because like, just think of I'm I'm a, I live a pretty sedentary life, so just imagine the cardio that's involved with like killing <laughs> like groups of people. I don't know. Like, it would be a it's a, it would be a hard sell for me. I realize we're we're probably straying away a little bit from the story, but when you think about it. You think about like the like the big the big two, right? So Jason and Freddy. Them motherfuckers aren't never running. I, I don't. Oh, I, yeah. I find it hard to believe they're getting any cardio. Michael Myers like, too. Like, yeah, yeah. That's you know like uh you know yeah I, that's what I meant. I think I said Freddy right because we were talking yeah. about it before the podcast. But yes, I, you don't see them really exerting themselves, right? The girl, she's <laughs> running top speed, right? And 
and he's just kind of meandering along at a, at a pretty standard pace and yet somehow catches her all the time. Um, yeah. Maybe that's yes. why they're, maybe it's their, uh, their mentality is like, it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> so yeah, I, I've just... seen your, I've seen your gate, right? Like your G A I T. I think you, yeah. you totally could, could do this job. Huh. I, you might be turning me around on this. There you go. Um, and I, the other thing is, like, you have to think about how much do I want my universe to survive? Like, right now, it's pretty miserable. So, like, it might be an act of mercy in some cases. That's true. Well, but, you know, I, yeah. I mean, we I, I suppose we can go on <laughs> just like a half-hour discussion about this. But some of that comes down to, like, your own desire to survive, right? So, yeah. Jenkins, and, and I guess I'll try to at least tie a little bit of a story into this conversation. Um, Jenkins is married has a daughter like he 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 seems to like his life he loves his wife he loves his kids so he does it um to protect them but to a certain extent there's got to be a thing of like wait i'm gonna die or i can do this thing like where, where your survival instinct kicks in you say well i'm gonna do the thing because it, it, not only am i saving the universe but fuck like i'm not ready to go yeah there is that so um, I want to say one more thing before we move on to explain a little bit as much as we can about this this very um, odd storyline that, that we were talking about. Um, I feel, and I have not verified this, but I feel that the scene that we see in Chapter 1, and, and it has its reasons, so I'm not saying this is plagiarism or anything like that, so I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I feel like that scene is taken like like swing for swing out of one of the Friday the 13th movies. And, you know, there's uh, and I, forgive me if, if you mention this, but like there it's at Camp Crystal Lake. So I'm not like just pulling Friday the 13th out of my ass. But I feel even like how these kids go down might actually be from like Friday the 13th part two. And that's just a guess at which one. But did you feel that way? Uh, I, yeah, I, I kind of got that maybe not super strongly, but the question, it did arise in my mind. And I think, um, man, I just watched that super big documentary on, um, shutter and I should, so like the, the fact should be stronger in my mind, but, um, that the, it's the sleeping bag, like death that, yep. um, got recreated that really like sparked the familiarity for me. And so, yeah, I believe that that sleeping bag death was specifically mentioned in that documentary. And I wish I remembered uh, which movie they said it was tied to, but yeah, I, I got that. I got that feeling where like, if it wasn't like shot for shot redone, that it was like heavily borrowed from. Yeah. I even feel like there's a, and again, guys, this is chapter. We haven't, we haven't stepped out of chapter one yet. So it sounds <laughs> like we're giving too much away. Trust, trust me. We, we barely scraped the surface. Um, where he, he runs the, is it a fireplace poker through the two kids that are having sex? Yep. Like I'm yeah, that barely certain happens. that's exactly that. Yeah. Out of, out of one of the movies. Yep. So I, I, but I feel like that might be an actual shot for shot, like uh, of a movie. So that being said, this mission out of the, uh, basically, uh, our, our, our hero Jenkins or our, our protagonist, I should say heroes, probably a really strong word. Um, you know, basically it's called do this once a month. So he's been there for roughly three years. So this is in whatever the 35th time or, or whatever that he's doing this. And for the first time, something genuinely goes wrong. And I don't know, again, still chapter one, right? But I don't know how, how much we want to, let, let's just say that the system that we're going to cover a little bit of here in the next portion um, is, uh, has, has just gone wrong. Yeah, so I don't think it spells anything to kind of to reveal what these uh, what what the job is like. So the job site, I guess, if you want to say. Um, so through the use of of some pretty sci fi technology, and I'm acknowledge this right now, it is uh, it is absolutely um, a very horror themed book, but it does have lots of sci-fi elements to it. And that was even um, the multiverse part of the synopsis should have at least kind of like, you know, perked up the, the, the hairs on your back, your neck, that there might be some sci-fi stuff going on. Essentially they travel through portals to get to and from the jobs where they have to go kill a bunch of people. But there's like a main like station or office or building or whatever you want to call it uh, that he travels back to. And we discover that there's like a few guys, a few other guys also doing this. And um, when they come back from their jobs, 
they just talk about it like they were out, you know, plowing the fields or something. It's very <laughs> yeah. mundane conversation between the guys. <laughs> and, you know, you said that what I was thinking of was like garbage men. Yeah. Like yeah. like meeting like, back up to like drop off their trucks, so to speak. Yeah, like blue that, collar. That's the feeling I got. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Not yeah, not even like trades work, just some blue collar sludge mm-hmm. of of work. Mm-hmm. But not only did Jenkins' job go wrong, basically everything they were involved in that day went wrong. And then the last thing I'm going to say that that's uh, potentially spoilery is um, because we brought up the multiverse, um, there starts to be some 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 credence lent to to the promise that if we don't do these things the right way, your universe can fail. And it does for one of the um, for one of the people that work at the station doing the same job Jenkins does. And there you have it. Like I said before, probably not going to go too much deeper into the plot of the story. But suffice to say, you basically have a handful of, you know, what any individual person in a world would would imagine is a rampaging serial killer. Um, but for these guys, it's just, you know, they're, they're punching the clock once a month um, for the sake of maintaining the balance of the universe, um, more or less. And so... Uh, we get this story because something has gone wrong with their routine and it has gone wrong in a way that's, it's not good for them. So uh, the story plays out as like figuring out what's going on and why and how to fix it um, with a lot of little crazy stuff happening along the way. Yeah. So I story wise, I, again, I don't think there's a whole lot, more we can go into. I mean, we, we gave you the first two chapters of whatever Rob's math was, 130 pages, right? So it's it's still, it's still a good percentage. Um, it's a little weird. So I, I guess I, I kind of want to discuss a little bit, um, although sci-fi um, and horror have co-mingled um, quite a few times, typically unsuccessfully in my opinion, and that's... Um, for me, that's Jason in outer space, and I believe at some point Pinhead from Hellraiser was also in outer space, and uh, I've I've never really cared about it. Um, this didn't feel like horror taking place inside sci-fi, which is how I feel those stories were. Um, and, and I'm not familiar with aliens and, and I know that's probably collective groans from, from the listeners when I say that, cause I haven't seen them. And, uh, but I also, I kind of understand the, 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 the thought of that also kind of sci-fi horror. This felt like more of a, of a crossover than that. Like, like a, like a force co-mingling of the two versus just saying, Hey, what if we just put Jason in a sci-fi situation? Did you feel that way too? Yes, I think uh, based on what you're saying, it's not um, it's not putting horror in a sci-fi setting. If that's what you're if that's what you're getting at, like like the Jason example right. and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but it's also not horrific sci-fi. Like uh, like the Alien series would that was going to be my example because but that's like a monster movie in space. So like obviously different than like your typical slasher. Uh, Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm trying to think of, I can't think, and I'm not an authority, so, you know, nobody get on my back about this shit, but I can't think of slashers in space. I couldn't think of an example if, if you, you know, if I tried, but, um, yeah, so it is kind of a unique, um, because it's almost like the story only relies on the sci-fi element as like, um, like a, like a, a, a framework in a way like there's there's sci-fi elements to it that are necessary to make all of the plot points happen but it's it's not yeah they don't mix together or something it's i'm I'm having a hard time explaining it but i hope that makes sense (laughs) i'm gonna explain for like the three people or so that (laughs) that maybe live in great britain that'll understand this reference so um i feel like Maybe you and I have talked about this. Maybe it's been on the podcast. There is a long-standing um, game show in in Great Britain called Countdown, and it's a game where um, it requires math and then like kind of like not word unscrambling, but like um, making words out of like a jumbled set of letters. And apparently, it's probably run for like forty years or something. 
And then over the last few years, there's been a, a show called Eight Out of Ten Cats, which is just comedians talking on issues of the day. Well, at some point, I think it was supposed to be like a one time kind of whatever special like holiday thing. They did eight out of 10 cats does countdown where they had comedians play this game show. And now it's been going for like five or six years. And I feel like this marriage of horror and sci fi is kind of eight out of 10 cats does countdown. I, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see what I'm saying? Like, not like, yeah, we just I know put, what you're we, like, like, yeah, like, it's not like um, when Family Feud has like celebrity football player teams. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just football players on the game show. Like, right. it's this kind of weird merge. Yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it would, it, it's interesting. And I'm, I mean, I'm a little curious on how one, one being Paul Michael Anderson, gets to this, <laughs> this, this very, strange and, and, and unique story yeah yeah it, it, it's definitely a, a weird approach um a, a, like unique is a great word because it's kind of script flipping as far as um you know who's who's in danger in a in a craze killer situation and stuff like that um and yeah like uh, yeah very unique <laughs> Um, the last thing I, I think well, I'm going to say about this is uh, there are, are a couple of characters introduced um, a little later in the story that that shed a little more light on on the whole thing. And it, it almost felt like a third element was introduced. And I, I don't want to go into what that element is or, or anything, but it, it at one point I actually felt like there was kind of like so you got horror sci-fi and then a third element dropped into it too which made it even more kind of weird for me yeah i guess the final thing i'll i'll say is that um it, it's a it's a it's a interesting book because of the of the disparate elements that it, it pulls together which i think it does a a good job of of incorporating things that you wouldn't expect to be put together uh in this way in the way this does like the sci-fi and and, and horror and everything um it's got kind of a, it, it's got a sometimes goofiness to it. So there's like some funny stuff that happens, and um, like at points, it's just got really creepy stuff uh, that happens. So yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a fun kind of romp in a way uh, that plays with with different genres and and melds them together in ways that I wasn't expecting. But for me, and I don't think that we're gonna do a spoiler talk about this, but. I think the best part of the book for me was when everything starts wrapping up at the end and we're figuring out what's going on kind of in like a, a bigger scale um, because it, it just, it was an interesting way to go and, and it, and it and just, it made me think about like, it's such a weird choice to get us there the way that the author chose to do it. Um, so yeah, I liked, I liked the re resolution of everything and along the way, there's just so much, so much murder. So that's always cool, too. <laughs> I want to spend just a couple of minutes because we did mention that there is a bonus story. So um, 156 pages for the regular story. And then we've got another additional um, 30 pages of a short story called The One Thing I Wished for You. Um, how do we want to like talk? Like, we'll just say that this um, we, we didn't have a plan really to talk about this, so I'll, I'll kind of shoot out a synopsis. Um, it is about a man who just had his first child, and he has made an interesting offer um, to uh, have this child uh, kept from pain. I guess is is probably all we could say about a thirty page story. Um, I really liked I really liked the short story um, in, in some ways. It's very different from the the novella that precedes it. Um, in some ways, I liked it better, um, although it, it's probably less. Sorry, like it's like less discussion worthy. You know what I mean? But it's uh, a. <laughs> It's a it's a nice addition. So it's kind of a, a two for one. You get the crazy shit that we spent the last 20 some minutes talking about. Right. And then to, to round it out, you get a little more. Um, 
a little more placid of a story. Um, it, it probably almost equally as, as weird, um, but but a little uh, more relaxed story to kind of take you off this roller coaster that you were on. And, and I, I thought he did a really nice job with that story. Yeah, it was cool. Um, and I won't go to We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, um, so I won't go into the, the particulars. But um, and then I, I, I'm cautious about this because, you know, someone who listens to this might then read the book. But like, I almost feel like I would have um, like to have read the short story first. Um, he even acknowledges in like his, his little note before the short story that um, one does kind of inform the other in a way there's like a very small connect connection between the two which i won't i won't reveal but um so like yeah it uh, either way you go about it if you read the book in the order it's printed or or if you read the short story and then main story um i think uh it adds context to what's going on i hope that doesn't i don't think it spoils anything because i didn't give any reason about why or how not at all um but yeah like um that story was cool because it was like your quick little like devil's bargain and consequences kind of it's a it's a you know i'm sure it's a story that's been told a million different ways but i think he did a good job with it um i I would like to say that um you know as rob said he kind of mentions it in the part that's entitled introduction and justification and i love i love that an author is justifying stuff before telling you another story i think that's that's great interesting yeah um I guess um, I guess we'll go to wrap ups. Um, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay with yeah, you. Sounds good. Um, this is a super weird book, and I say that uh, for all the reasons that you heard, and then some reasons that will only become more ev- you know evident if you read the book. And we can't go down that path um, with you um, without spoiling the book. So um, here's what I'll say: I uh, uh, it, it was a very interesting story. Um, I actually really like the conclusion, and that's what I'll say about that is the the wrap up of the big story. Although I had some kind of niggling issues um, towards the end, I think that the overall wrap up was my my favorite part and received the highest score that that uh, that I gave to any of the eight categories that we um, that we um, review the book on. Um, the two lowest uh, I gave it was uh, uh, characters. Um, I only gave a five for characters, and it's because I didn't really feel attached to any of the characters. Like I said, the story. I the story stands well enough on, on its own without a ton of character development or character attachment. That being said, if there was more character development or if I felt more of an attachment to the characters, would the story have benefited? And the answer is probably yes. It doesn't need it. I still enjoyed the story and, and its uniqueness and quirkiness. Um, and then the other one was pace. And, and pace, um, I feel like it was uneven throughout the story. So I felt like it kind of started off with a little bit of a bang, then it really, really slowed down and then it really picked up and then it kind of slowed down again. Um, So that's kind of where I'm at. So favorite thing about the book, um, definitely the conclusion, least favorite thing about it, um, probably a combination of pace and and characters. And that's not not to say that I I disliked the characters or, you know, that the pace, it just wasn't, um, (laughs) it just wasn't my speed. Um, So overall, after averaging out the uh, eight categories that we review the book on, my final score comes out to a 6.75 for standalone. All right. Um, I will try not to to retread any of the the stuff we've already talked about. Um, This book is is a fun, goofy romp of a book. Um, I don't think that it takes itself too seriously, even though it does explore serious things and, um, uh, you know, does some kind of fucked up stuff stuff that we did and could not mention um but yeah like the strength of this book to me was the plot and the tone um the story that it was trying to tell um was a really confusing one in ways and and a little bit complicated but came off in a very simple like it was simple to read so like he simplified really complex thoughts in a way so i had to give points for that um but the overall like story that he was telling i thought was interesting and um and entertaining and then tone uh he throws out some real creepy stuff um he hits a horror vibe i think pretty well and um it it contributed well to the overall story 
And yeah, like Livia said, um, the conclusion of the book, uh, while we can't explain any of why it's good, is probably one of the stronger points of it, the way he kind of pulls everything together and reveals it to the reader. Um, so based on that, um, I, I think it's just a fun, quick read. I, I did read it. Did I read it in one sitting? It didn't take long. It's a very fast read. So um, it, it's fun and interesting and does unique new stuff that I don't think I've really read much of before. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and overall, I gave it a score of 7.25, um, a little bit higher than Livius, which averages the the podcast out to a 7 out of 10. I feel it's it's really a must-read for somebody who's a fan of like the slasher genre because it does do new and interesting things. And I, I just wanted to get that out there that although I don't like I've read slasher books, I've enjoyed more um, because of the structure of this book. I feel like I'm, I'm glad I read it. And I think that anybody who's into that type of horror um, w- would, would benefit from, from this particular take on the slasher genre. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And honestly, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, who I bet was would love this is people who write horror, like uh, other horror authors are probably really enjoying this uh, because y- you tend to think about those things and break them down in a way that, you know, uh, maybe me and Livius don't. But yeah, I-, I agree. Like it would be something that I would include in a like if someone was like, give me a list of the slasher books that you think someone starting out should read it, it would be an easy inclusion in that list yep all right i know the one other thing that you want to talk about that i want you to talk about because i know you'll do it kind of in a spoiler free way is i have not gotten around to seeing the devil all the time which is the netflix adaptation of donald ray pollock's book so i'm, I'm really interested to get your take on that yeah so um first i want to acknowledge that uh we read and reviewed the devil all the time, um, nine years ago. So, uh, or eight years ago, it's either eight or nine. I don't remember, but, um, a long time ago. So, uh, I didn't have a chance to reread the book, obviously before checking out the movie. Um, or even, I I guess I could have listened to our review. That would have been the smart thing to do. Um, but I didn't, I just dove right into watching that movie and I really enjoyed it. Um, that's it's a concern and and we see as we've been doing this podcast almost a decade now we see movies get adapted that we've read for the podcast or just read and loved outside of the podcast and like the thing you want the least is for it to be a bad adaptation (laughs) so there's always this kind of like trepidation going into something like that and um i think they did a very good job first of all did you see the cast like it's huge yeah, so I know that um, um, Edward the vampire is in it. <laughs> that that's yes, that's Edward all I know. the vampire is in it. Yes, all Team right. Edward. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the IMDb uh, sure. uh, list. All right, so Robert Pattinson, who is Edward, that's the um, guy. Yep, Spider Man's in it. The new Spider Man, Tom Holland, the little guy. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and I'm going to do this for all the characters if I can think of who they played. Um, Pennywise in the new It movies, Bill Skarsgård. Okay. All right. I know that is. Uh, it's, it's probably as far as I'm going to go with these funny, jokey things. But <laughs> Sebastian Stan, who is uh, I'm trying to think of what else I've seen him in. He's one of those things. He, he oh, oh, he plays um, Captain America's best friend in those Captain America movies, the guy with the metal arm. He plays Bucky? He plays Bucky. The Winter Soldier. Yeah, Bucky's in this. Uh, Jason Clark uh, is... He's an actor that I see in a ton of stuff, but I can't think of what I've seen seen him in recently. Um, Just a big cast. There's a ton of, like, really, really good actors. And um, so it takes place in... What is it? 1950s? Like, Ohio? Um, That area. And so the... The period work is just great. Um, it really gives it like a mid-century rural America feel. I feel like they pulled that off wonderfully. Um, and everybody, all the actors just brought it. Um, they did a very, very good job. Oh, I forgot to mention one of the cast is Donald Ray Pollock himself 
was the narrator for the movie. So they actually got the original author to narrate the film, which I thought was awesome. Um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I'm seeing the words like eerie, disturbing, and, you know, I like eerie and disturbing things. Um, if I remember correctly, does this not take place in Knock'em Stiff, which was his other novel, which was like that interlaced short story collection? Uh, you are correct. So <laughs> not entirely, but like it does... A lot of it happens in Knock'em Stiff, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted, there was like two, three different times I wanted to start this, but it is like almost two and a half hours. I think it's like two hours mm -hmm. and 20 minutes or something to movie. And, and it just at no time did I either have the time to watch it in one sitting or not feel that I was going to fall asleep like, you know, 15, 20 minutes in because I was tired. It's on my list of things to do this week, though. Yeah. The thing that concerns me about, um, and I haven't looked at I haven't looked at ratings too much, but like the beginning, it's kind of a slow burn because it's um, there's a little bit of a fractured timeline going on, but um, it looks at people of multiple generations and it looks at them different times in their life. So there's a lot of like um, establishing and foundation that's laid in early, and I think that's why the movie is as long as it is because um, it really hits um, it really hits a, a good pace pretty far in like you're 45 minutes in before um it really finds its footing after establishing and like introducing all the different like elements that are being played out so um because there's uh for anybody who's i mean I, it took me a while to remember everything from the book but like there's these like this couple that drives around killing people taking like photographs of them so that's one storyline there's the main storyline, which is this family um, where the, you know, the dad came back from Viet, not Vietnam, came back from a war and um, like raises his, you know, his kid. And, and yeah, so like there's there's a lot of different elements that, that have to get established and, and they eventually kind of pull together into the meat of the story. So it's not the quickest like beginning. And I'm worried that people would um, have a problem with that. But man it, it, once it's once it's rolling it's it's pretty good it's pretty intense um i'm doing this from uh, with my faulty memory from eight ish years ago but i do believe we had the first audio interview with donald ray pollock after he published mm -hmm. yeah so um uh, very cool <laughs> i just wanted to throw that out there just brag. in case anybody's yeah yeah just just a little bit um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think you're right. I think I might queue up the uh, the podcast where we reviewed it to get a little bit of a refresher. Because as you were talking, I was like, well, that sounds kind of familiar. But I don't know if I could have pulled that out on my own about, you know what I mean? Like right. a couple driver. Yeah. So uh, but that's on Netflix. So uh, everybody has Netflix, right? Or you have someone's Netflix password. So uh, sounds like uh, Rob is recommending this as a must see on Netflix. Yeah, it was very good. And, and in our group of people, anybody who's posting about it on social media is also giving it high high points so i definitely recommend checking it out um but again it's a it's a time commitment like livia said it's almost two and a half hours long and it's a slow burn at the beginning but i think it still has enough interesting stuff going on to to compel you through to to when it picks up steam so yeah definitely go check it out congrats to donald ray pollock like it's For it's sure. it's nice to have a movie ad adaptation of your book and it's even better when it's good <laughs> Well, and you get to be involved with it. That's yeah. the whole third, right? Like, um, you know, Josh Mallerman was super excited that he could just be on the set of Bird Box for a couple of days, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, like Donald Ray Pollock got to be a integral part. I'm assuming that if he's narrating it, he's probably in it, you know, um, from a, a voice amount. standpoint. Yeah, so that's awesome that he also gets to partake in it. Yeah, and I'll be honest with you. I think, I think that people who read the book and enjoyed it will get a little extra kick out of Pollock being in it. Because it's straight up like he's reading like line for line stuff out of the book. So it really makes it more of like more intimately tied to the book instead of like an adaptation that takes takes concepts from. Um, so I thought that because he's such a great fucking writer and I forgot because it's been a while since I read any of his stuff. But like it's got such like poetry and, and gravity to it. Um, so it gave it gave the movie like a more heavy, more uh, important feel 
So um, including him was a very, very good choice. Even more excited about seeing it now. You know what's funny? I keep saying things like, oh, I was tired, so I want to put a two and a half hour movie. <laughs> Here's what movies should do. They should go ahead and put him out as chapters on YouTube. See, because if this was like a 15 minute thing, I'd have watched like the first 15 minutes and then the next thing in the playlist would just be part two. And I'd probably have no problem watching it if it was in chunks broken up on YouTube. But sit down for two and a half hours, man. That's tough for me to do nowadays. I'm sure that you'll binge like six one hour episodes of something in a row, though, without a problem. Abs without without a doubt. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the thing. But if you tell me the one thing is two hours and 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, I don't know when I'm going to carve out the time. That's... to do that so yeah it's 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 a i i realize it's a complete mental block thing i've gotten like this with reading too and it's because of this podcast like i am very accustomed to now reading in just half hour chunks and then you just parcel it out throughout the week yep yep absolutely and you know what if i were to pick up a book next week that was just for me to read it would probably be the exact same thing because it's the rhythm that i'm now used to before it used to be Oh, I've got five minutes. Maybe I can knock out a chapter. And then that night we'd like three hours. Yeah. And now it's like, I, I, even if I'm off or I'm, I'm just sitting at a, you know, whatever, a outdoor outside a hot dog shop, like literally like 27 minutes. And I'm like, all right, well, that's, that's enough reading for now. Like, I, <laughs> like you could set a clock by it. Wow. That's bonkers. Uh, but yeah. we, we, just, well, I mean, I can't point a finger because we all know that my habit is to just sit down and read it all like the exact opposite read it all in yeah. one sitting one sitting yeah so <laughs> so yeah i guess no matter how you do it you're still you're still doing it right movie or uh or tv show or or books so um we do have one other uh worthy thing to mention um last week we reviewed labyrinth of dolls by craig walwork um, it is now available in paperback. I'll let Rob um, read the rest of his little note on here. <laughs> For all of our Luddite listeners, you, like <laughs> you don't want to read it on a Kindle. You can get the paperback. Um, yeah. And it's funny because if you're a Luddite, you're probably not listening to our podcast. That's, uh... The funny part is I don't think anybody, anybody was excited as you because of the book collection, right? Oh, yeah. Like, if it didn't come out in paperback, you're like, fuck, that's another hole on my shelf. There's already, I, I, I don't know how many, but there's got to be five or six, right, that we've read that were ebook only. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's about that. And I've been thinking, now that you mention it, I've been trying to think of ways to have a physical representation of the book. Like, what if I had mole skins and I, I just printed out something with the title, you know, so at least, like, I know when that book showed mm -hmm. up. So if anybody has any interesting ideas of how I could, like the, obviously you could just print out, like, you know, if I had a PDF of it, I could print it out and, sh and shelf it, you know, but, um, I was thinking like, what would be a cooler visual way of doing that? So I'm open to ideas. If anybody can think of anything. Cracks me up as you said, moleskin, but I know I happen to know you have a pile of notebooks you're never going to use. I'm not going to say what kind of <laughs> notebooks there are, but I once saw a stack of like 25 notebooks. Yep. I think those would do as well. <laughs> so. Yeah. But then like, you know, I, I don't know if like getting a label maker, you know, what you could do is what we did with the original FCJR book. You can go down oh. to the local um, um, thrift store. You can buy some hardcovers. <laughs> you, you could download the, the, the um, ebook art, uh, assuming it's still available, print it, wrap it, put it on your shelf. That's a, that's not a bad idea. I might have yeah. to do that. I might have to just like, but then I was thinking I could also have a QR code on the spine. That would like link me somehow <laughs> to the actual ebook. Now you're now you're really getting carried away, but I, it's a cool idea. Yeah. So I just want you to have that thing complete. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I realize that it'll essentially never be complete. You know what I mean? That it continues to go. But I think there will be a satisfaction uh, available to you when you're 100 percent caught up with everything we have done. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, I'm rooting for you. Rooting what was that your you way of asking without asking what percent I'm at? <laughs> No, no, I'm just saying that, you know, I, I, I know there's a couple of more elusive um, um, books out there, but I, I'm sure you're, I mean, I don't even know how many books we've reviewed. Like, I, I don't, like, I don't know if you keep like a running count. I have no oh, idea. I imagine it's 230. That we've reviewed total? Yeah. Oh, I mean, hold on to your, hold on to your socks, buddy. 
Oh wait, I got to find the right spreadsheet. I have so many these days. Um, that last time I checked was just, just sometime in the last week or so we are on, uh, this is, I think book 295. Holy shit. Around the corner from our 300th book. Um, wow. And of those, I have about 260 print cop, you know, in, in print on my shelves. Wow. Well, there you go. And they just keep piling up. The nice thing is people keep sending us books now. So we've gotten to the point where a lot of stuff is coming in print editions. So uh, I think that that probably is everything for this week, right? The only thing left to do is, is, is talk about what's next week. Yeah. So I will reiterate, um, listen to us on Amazon Music, watch The Devil All the Time on Netflix, go buy the paperback of Labyrinth of the Dolls, and uh, yeah. Come come back and check out whatever Livius is about to tell you about. Next week we will be reviewing um, the the final book this year that we have had like great anticipation for, right? So the rest of the year, obviously we're going to review stuff, but there was a cluster of books that at the beginning of the year we were kind of chomping at the bit to get to. Uh, the Loop by Jeremy Robert Johnson will round out that list um, for us next week. Here's what I will say. Publishers Weekly said it's unput downable, which is just a terrible word. So that's not a judgment on the book. It's totally a judgment on Publishers Weekly. I feel like they they use an uh, ungainly word like that on purpose, like in a mm-hmm. cheeky way. Could be. Fucking cheeky people. I would just like to remind people that Jeremy Robert Johnson has written one of the greatest short stories ever, ever. <laughs> so I just like to mention that every time it comes up. What's the name of the story again? I always forget. Um, we reviewed it in Entropy and Bloom, and it is the sharp dressed man at the end of the line. Um, one of my top two, top two favorite, all time favorite short stories. So uh, if you get a chance, I don't even know if that's in print. I don't know. But get, get that, read that. And then we're going to talk, uh, I'm guessing, extensively about the loop next week. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, looking forward to talking about, man, every time Jeremy Robert Johnson comes up, I get excited about it because I've just loved everything I've read. So looking forward to that. Join us next time. Uh, until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading.